We are wrapping up our series in Colossians. It's been the Rooted series. That's what we've titled it because we've talked about being rooted in Christ. We've talked about being rooted in relationships. We spent some time talking about some of the, the fungi that attack the roots of the giant sequoia trees and, and put them at risk. Now, here's a little tidbit of information. I don't think I've shared this with you, is that at the University of Nebraska, I needed one more science credit. And so I took a course called Fungi and Man. So a one credit course on fungi. We talked about root fungi and corn fungi, and we talked about uh, Irish potato plight. So this week, we've, um, in, in this series, we've talked about the, the fungus that attack the root caused by the removal or the lack of removal of the stumps of the white oak trees that then attack the sequoia trees. So we've talked about what it looks like to live a rooted life, evidence of our lives rooted in Christ and all the things, the weeds that come in and try to smother out the life of those roots. Now, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, we're going to turn to the final greetings of Paul in the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 4. If you need a pew Bible, there should be one close by, either in front of you, under the seat where you're sit seated, Colossians 4, verses 7 through 18, that's page 1167 in the pew Bible. So here in Colossians... Again, beginning at verse 7, we learn about many of Paul's relationships. Verse 7 begins with this. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He's a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. So the first person we see is Tychicus. You may recall, we've talked about him previously, he was also mentioned in the book of Ephesians because he was the one who would take the book of Ephesians as well as the book of Colossians, letters that they would take back to the church from Paul's imprisonment. In addition, would also bring the book of Philemon, the book that was written to Philemon by Paul to instruct him about the release of Onesimus. So he would bring these books on kind of a cyclical route and deliver those to the churches where they would have the conversations. And so Paul sent this personal letter with him to the Colossians. And these terms of endearment, he's a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant of the Lord, really is kind of the Christian ideal, I think, in Paul's life of what he hopes that those involved with ministry look like. They're dear brothers, they're faithful ministers, and their fellow servants are better yet slaves of the Lord. Along with Tychicus, Paul mentions Onesimus, and Onesimus is coming with him. And as I've just, just explained, as Onesimus was the slave who had come to Christ under Paul's teaching. And because of that, Paul's desire, now he calls him a dear brother, which is a great transformation in identity, isn't it? He goes from being slave to being brothers. And in fact, we've seen this before in Colossians. We've seen it in Ephesians. We've seen it in other of Paul's writings that we are taken from slavery and made brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, in this instance, Onesimus was literally a slave. But now Paul calls him brother, and he sends Onesimus back to Philemon. The desire here is that he comes back to Philemon, who was his master, who was his owner, and that the relationship would be completely transformed. Now, there is no indication that he calls for his emancipation, but there is a distinction there that he goes, he is a brother. He is one who is loved. He is one that we care about. And so the relationship was transformed, although Paul did, did send him back to his master in that sense. Which I think tells us a lot about roles and responsibilities, because we each have roles. There was a relationship of a master to a slave. Previously we talked about the relationship of a man and a, a husband and a wife, a father and a child. So there continues to be roles, but those relationships aren't authoritarian or dictatorial relationships, but they're benevolent, loving, kind relationships. And what a change of circumstances this must have been for Onesimus as his identity is transformed from slave to brother. So these two messengers come with Paul's greetings and, and, and they tell others about Paul's circumstances. That's what he tells them. He says, they will tell you the rest of the story. 
And we don't know what they would tell them about the particular circumstances, but they were there to communicate because they had been with Paul in his imprisonment. So in addition to Paul's greetings, there are greetings too from Aristarchus and Mark and Jesus, who is called Justice. Paul identifies these three as the only Jews among his co-workers and, and holds on to that as a sense of, uh, of joy and celebration that he's got some who have come alongside him who, who came out of the Jewish faith. But then there are those others who are Gentiles. So there's this mixing of Jews and Gentiles and that is the picture of the church. And here as he celebrates these three Jewish co-workers, he tells us Aristarchus has been a long t- we, we know that Aristarchus has been a long-term companion of Paul. He had shared time with him in prison. He had shared time with him on his missionary journeys. And then he tells us about Jesus, who was also called Justice. And that's really all we know about him. Clearly a distinction there from Jesus, who is the Savior. Just as in today, there are people who share the name Jesus, who are not Jesus of Nazareth. But then there's Mark. And we have a great deal of information about Mark. He did write the gospel for which, the one which bears his name. And it says here in Colossians that he is Barnabas' cousin. Now what we know is that in the book of Acts, Paul had been traveling and he'd been sent out with Barnabas. And in time, Barnabas had invited Mark to join them. But earlier in Pamphylia, Mark had deserted Paul in their ministry journeys. And because he had deserted him, Paul was reluctant to invite him back. In fact, he and Barnabas, Barnabas whose, names mean son, whose name means son of encouragement, went different ways. Because Paul was unwilling to invite Mark back to be part of the journey. Which was always interesting to me that here that Barnabas, the son of encouragement, and Paul, the famous Christian leader, got to this place in their spiritual life and in the journey that there was such a distinction that they couldn't make amends. And so they went separate ways. And it tells us that there are times when that's going to happen, that it's not necessarily a sinful issue to go different ways because there's a different priority, a different purpose that's being pursued. But in time, we know that the trust is rebuilt and Mark later is established. In fact, if you go just a couple of verses, interesting. There's an interesting, um, well, you go 12 years past the time when he deserted him in Pamphylia. And we come here now to the book of Colossians. And what does it say? You have received instructions about him, that is Mark. If he comes, welcome him. So 12 years after Mark had deserted Paul, the relationship is restored. In fact, he says, welcome them. And I don't know what the instruction was, whether an instruction that the Colossian church had received had been the previous warning that Mark is a deserter, don't embrace him, and now he's turning back that instruction to say, that's done, now embrace him. Or if the instruction that they had received had come earlier and said, this happened some time ago, the relationship has been reconciled, so go ahead and embrace him. But the end story is this. There's this message of hope. Receive him. Welcome him. He's to be trusted and to be received into the congregation. Now, it took some time, of course. But in the end, it says, welcome him. And so we have Onesimus, who was once a slave, who's to be considered a brother. And we have Mark, who was once a deserter, who is to be welcomed back. And that's really the story of the gospel, isn't it? Relationships that are reconciled. People who are brought back in. Identities that are transformed because of the good news of Jesus Christ. So for Mark, his relationship ended well. And it was restored. But now look at verse 12 in this Colossians chapter 4. There's another list. There are a list of Gentiles and Gentiles who have supported Paul in his ministry. And they include Epaphras, Luke, and Demas. And we've talked about Epaphras. Epaphras, you'll remember, was the one who who planted the church. Who had gone, so to speak, to a crusade in Ephesus where he heard the gospel message of Paul. And as a response, he came back and he planted a church. 
And it says of Epaphras in verse 12, he is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. Epaphras was constantly praying. And we talked about that last week, the importance of prayer in the context of reaching the lost. But in this situation, he's talking about prayer for the sake of the church for which he planted. His love for the church, the people who were the sheep, and he was their shepherd. He prayed for them. And Paul goes on regarding Epaphras to say, I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. You see, Epaphras started a movement. It went back to the church in Colossae, but it didn't end there. He also took it over to the Laodicean church and to the church in Hierapolis. And so the good news had reached him, and he took that good news to his hometown, but then to the surrounding communities and to the community beyond that. Remember in Acts chapter 1, 8, it says, You shall be my witnesses from Jerusalem. That would be for the disciples their hometown. To, G- to Judea, the region surrounding them. To Samaria, the cross-cultural experience beyond that. And the uttermost parts of the earth. So the message went out. And Epaphras understood that. And went from community to community, planting churches and telling people about Jesus. And so he prays for those in his church. And like Paul, Epaphras wrestled in prayer, the importance of prayer in ministry. And what does it say that he prayed for? He says he prayed for their maturity. And we've talked from time to time, what does it mean to be mature Christians? Because before you know Christ, the Bible describes you as this, dead in your trespasses and sins. So you start out as dead, but then you come to the cross and you confess your sins and you receive Jesus. And the description that's used at that point is you are infants in Christ. You're like babes longing for the the pure milk of the word, but you need to move beyond the milk and you need to move on to the meat, the Bible tells us. So you grow in your spiritual walk and then you become spiritual young men and young women. Not based on age, but on spiritual maturity to the place where Christian maturity is defined as those who are spiritual parents. They're telling others about Jesus. They're multiplying their faith into the lives of others. Just as Epaphras did, multiplied his faith into the lives of other people. And he prays for those under his own leadership that they too would come to spiritual maturity. And he also prays this. He prays for their spiritual assurance. I don't know if you've experienced that in your own life, those moments of doubt where you're wondering, am I really saved? And let me ask you this question. If you were to die tonight, do you know for certain that if you were to die that you would go to heaven? I think many of you have asked that question of others. I've asked it of numbers of people. And often we get, well, I hope so. In the book of 1 John, chapter 5, and verse 13, it says, These things have been written that you may know for certain that you have eternal life. You can have assurance of your salvation. Salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ and nothing else. And that's been the repeating theme of the book of Colossians. It's not Jesus and, but faith in Jesus alone, being in Christ, that you have salvation. If you have received Christ, you can have the assurance of your salvation. Remember even John the Baptist who was in in prison sent his disciples to Jesus. Are you really who you say you are? And the response back was the lame walk and the blind see. And he truly is the Savior. And when you trust in Jesus, you truly are saved. And you can have that assurance of salvation. And the Bible tells us that the, the, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are God's children. So the Spirit of God is bearing witness with you. And that's Epaphras' prayer for the people, is that they would have the assurance of their salvation. And now back in Colossians, Paul's list of those who send their greetings goes on and includes Luke. Here he's identified as a doctor. And he is none other than the one who the third gospel is named named after, as well as the book of Acts. Acts. 
And this is what we know about him, is what we have from the book of Acts. He did a great deal of research into the book of Luke and the book of Acts. Really, it was really essentially one book, two scrolls contained together based on uh, an extended research that he put together about this person of Jesus and then the spread of the gospel from Jerusalem to, to Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And here he's identified as a doctor, which raises an interesting point about the nature of the Colossian church. You had slaves and you had doctors. You had Jews and you had Greeks. It was a very diverse group of people. And then the third individual that Paul lists in this group is Demas. And like the others, Demas at this point was a trusted friend and co-worker. He had spent time with Paul. He was there with Paul in this imprisonment. But unfortunately, this, does, this relationship doesn't end well. Mark, his relationship that had been broken was restored, but Demas, well, in the book of Timothy, it says this, Demas, in love with the present world, has deserted me and gone on to Thessalonica. So just a few years after the writing of the book of Colossians, we see Demas, whose life had been lived for Christ alongside Paul, who now walks away and lives for the world in Thessalonica. So Mark should hold out hope for us, but Demas should be a warning to all of us. Do not pursue the things of this world. Do not go after the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. Here was someone who had a great ministry experience, but then he pursued the things of this world. And we don't know if it was the lust of the flesh that got him. We don't know if it was the lust of the eyes or the boastful pride of life, but we do know he pursued the world. It may have been he was just pursuing an easier life rather than facing persecution rather than having to go here and there and face storms and shipwrecks, he thought, I'm going to a life of leisure. <clears throat> Such a difference between Mark and Demas. Mark is restored, but Demas is estranged. And the Bible is filled with instructions about church discipline. In Matthew chapter 18, it talks about putting those out from among you. And there are times in the Christian life where there are those who are among you that will be put out, will go their own direction. Again, very telling of the truth about what a gospel community looks like. And doesn't Jesus even warn that among the sheep will be those and will dress like sheep who are actually wolves? So there are those in the church that will go out from the church, but there are those that will be restored as well. Now in Colossians chapter 4, verse 15, Paul turns from the greetings of others to his own personal greetings. And he extends, extends greetings to those in Laodicea. In verse 16, he instructs those, instruct that the letter be read to the church of Laodicea. And that they uh, then read the Colossian letter, which again goes to the cyclical nat nature of this. Now, we do not have a recorded book letter to the Laodiceans. We have in our canon the book of Colossians. But somewhere out there was a letter that Paul wrote to the Laodiceans. And, th and they were to read the letter from the Laodiceans. And the Laodiceans were to read the book of Colossians. And then Paul goes on to greet Nympha, who has offered her home as the meeting place for the church in Laodicea. I think that's very telling as well, that here a woman, Nympha, opens her home that the gospel might be spread. And he talks about Archippus. See to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. I think it's important when we consider the people that Paul has listed here is, is the, array, the, the array of gifts that these people have received. Nampha with the gift of hospitality. Archippus, who seems to be the son of Philemon, who is standing in place at the Colossian church to lead it at this time, using his gifts of leadership or teaching. There were those with the gifts of intercession, praying on behalf of others. 
Some have the gift of leadership. Some have the gifts of teaching. The Bible is filled with examples of different gifts that we have been given as we receive Jesus Christ into our life, that the body of Christ might be built up. And that's just one of the realities of the church. And so this morning, there are three realities that I want to kind of focus on in light of these names that we've just listed. The first one reality is this. Ministry happens in the context of relationships. Ministry happens in the context of relationships. If you see all the people that are involved in the advancement of the gospel, there is no room for lone rangers. Not even the apostle Paul was a lone ranger in ministry. He surrounded himself with prayer warriors. He surrounded himself with people with hospitality. He surrounded himself with those who would bring the message to other people. Ministry can't help happen by one person. It's not a job for the professionals. Every one of us has been given a gift, and that's the second reality. The second reality is this. Ministry happens through the gifts of many. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says, About the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. And I love this passage. In verse 7 there, it talks about the manifestation of the Spirit. Well, a little bit earlier it talked about you worship idols that were mute. They had no voice. And then he comes and says the manifestation, which literally means the outspeaking, the speaking forth. So you worship that which had no voice, but now you worship that which has a voice. The manifestation of the Spirit, the voice of God going out, is seen in the lives of us, the body of Christ, using our spiritual gifts for the sake of ministry. Stop worshiping things that have no voice, but rather be the voice of God by using your spiritual gifts. And so he talks about the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, and he talks about the gifts in Romans 12, including gifts of service and teaching and encouragement, generosity and leadership, to name a few. Each one of you has received a gift as the Spirit has seen fit, that the body of Christ might be built up, it says in Ephesians 4. So we serve that the body of Christ might be built up, not as individuals, but each one serving as if the foot could say to the hand, I have no need for you. That would be silly, wouldn't it? That's the illustration Paul gives us. We can't say to the other parts of the body, we have no need for you because we need each other. Each part of the body has a gift that is to be used. Romans, again, tells us we have different gifts. According to the grace, each one has been given to us. By the grace of the Spirit determining what it is that you need and what the church needs, so he gifts you accordingly. And there's a third reality, and it's that ministry happens through personal sacrifice. Paul tells both, Paul calls Tychicus and Epaphras, this is the term he used, servants is what you're translation says, but it is literally slaves. Which, get into the mind right now of Onesimus, who had come to faith in Christ, had been told now that he is a brother, but now he is to be a slave. You know, the truth is this, you can't not be a slave. It's like a diet. If you want to be free from fat, you have to be a slave to healthy eating. And so you have to count up the cost and determine what is it you will be a slave to. We are told that we are slaves to sin. Will you be a slave to sin or will you be a slave to Christ? And it comes at a cost because we are servants of Christ. We are bond servants of Christ, serving Him and serving His purposes and not our own. Aristarchus, Mark, and Jesus called justice. They're called fellow workers. It's, the word there is diakonos, from which we get the word deacon. They are fellow workers in the ministry. They are coming alongside to do the ministry. Each of us is called to do the work of ministry with an attitude of a slave, willing to do whatever Christ asked of us. But not everyone is willing to make that sacrifice. And that was the case for Demas, who went and pursued the things of this world. Jesus says in Luke 14, verse 33, he says, those of you who do not give up everything cannot be my disciples. 
This is the radical call of the Lord, that we give up everything, that we might be his disciples. It's not giving up as we choose, but as he calls. What I want isn't important. It's what Christ wants that's important. And what was Christ's driving passion? To seek and to save the lost. What are you willing to give up to pursue Christ's passion to seek and save the lost? Even Jesus, it says, did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. How much more should we take on the posture of a slave, serving the very one who gave his life as a ransom for our own? In the church, there's this reality. And it's a lot like a ship. And we each have a role to play, and we each find our place in this ship. And this isn't going to be a picture of, of, of a boat, but we're going to look at this. Here is your buy-in, your level of buy-in down here. And this is your level of involvement. And so as your buy-in increases and your involvement increases, which is really what Christ is calling us to do, is to have a greater buy-in into his mission and a greater buy-in into the involvement of his ministry, to be slaves and to be servants, right? And so there are four different types of people. There are those who have a great deal of buy-in, but little involvement. And those are the passengers on this ship. You know, that's the type of person who is on the cruise ship. And they've gotten on the boat and they want their Mai Tais and they want their buffets and they're all access to the ice cream machine. They want the towel boy to bring them their towels and the oil. They want somebody to care for them, to serve them, and to help them to be comfortable and cared about, right? Those are the passengers. But there's another group, there's those with a great deal of buy-in and a great deal of involvement, and those are the crew. These people see their ship not as a cruise ship, but a battleship. And they're swabbing the deck, and they paint the whole hull, and they, 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 they stock the pantry, because they know they're on a mission. And this mission is going to cost them, it could cost them their lives. But they know that each person has a role to play and each person has a place to fill and they go out and they're part of that mission because each person knows that they've been called to something bigger than themselves. They're part of the crew. Now over here, with little buy-in and little involvement, those are the castaways. Wrong word, stowaways. That would be Tom Hanks. Wrong movie. <laughs> Stowaways. They're along for the ride, but they're not involved, and they really don't think the ship's going in the right direction. And then there's a fourth group who have little buy-in. They don't really like the direction the ship's going at all, but they have a great deal of, of involvement. And this group is called the pirates. And they jump aboard the ship, and they commandeer this ship, and they want to turn the ship to their own purposes. So there's four types of people on this crew. In fact, we see it here in the book of Colossians. We see these four people in the book of Colossians. We see the stowaways. Stowaways, really, Demas. He was happy to be on, on the ship as long as it went his direction, but as soon as it didn't, he bailed out and, and went his own, his own direction. Now we have Mark, who started here as a passenger. And here's the good news, and here's the message of hope for that, is he was able to become a crew member again. He maybe was even a little bit over here towards the stowaway because he was along until things didn't go the direction he wanted to go. And so he bailed, but he was restored. He was along to get what he wanted out of it. And when it didn't go his way, they parted, they, they went different directions. But then we have this group. 
Nympha, Epaphras, all those others who Paul commends for being slaves and servants along with them. Onesimus. All of those were these crew members. Now you're wondering who the pirates are, and it's not in this passage, but we've talked about it a lot in this book of Colossians. It's what, who were the Halakhic Jews? And for some of you that term is new, but we have talked about it the last few weeks. The Halakhic Jews were the ones that means fence. And so they had taken God's Old Testament law and they put a fence around it because rather than offending the law, they wanted this fence just in case they broke through the fence, they wouldn't fall into the cliff, right? It was a guardrail, so to speak. And for them, it was saying you have to keep the Jewish laws, you have to keep the Jewish traditions, you have to follow the Jewish calendar. And those were the ones who were leading the Colossians astray for all this time, trying to say that you have to be Jewish before you can be a Christian. And so they wanted to take the ship and they wanted to turn it a different direction and go somewhere that Jesus, that, or that Paul wasn't going. So the real question here is where do you see yourself on the ship? And here's the thing is pirates want to commandeer, right? They want to take over the ship and they want to control it. They have a lot of involvement, even a lot of power sometimes but they have very little buy-in to the direction things are going. And then the stowaways are really just consumers. There's probably a better word, like leech, because they suck out the resources but give nothing back, whereas passengers maybe are a little bit more on the consumer side because they come in and everything is meant to be for them, especially in our culture today, right? Lots of consumers in our culture that will go because that's what appeals to them. But what we're looking for are the committed. The crew members who are willing to come on board the mission to give their lives for what God has called them to, to what God has called the church to. For the Colossian church, it was different than it was for our Savior's Baptist church. Each church has its unique mission in a particular context and a particular time. And you can find yourself in one of those places. So there are four groups. And the good news of Colossians is, is that each of us, we don't have to settle for being a pirate or a stowaway or simply a passenger. Each of us can take the next step. And in case you're thinking that all of us are in this place where we've reached perfection. That's certainly not true. And there will be days when we're more like a passenger than we are a crew member. Because there's no perfect people allowed, right? Not a single one of us in here has it all together. And sometimes we get to this place in our Christian life where we're happy to be disciples when Christ is calling us to be disciple makers. And we need to take that next step to be disciple makers. But as Mark was restored to a place of faith, you can be too. Tychicus was called a dear brother, a faithful minister, a fellow servant. Each of us, like Tychicus, has, be, has been called to be part of the family of God. Each of us, like Tychicus, has been called to be a servant. Each of us, like Tychicus, is called to be a faithful minister. Onesimus, who once, is, once was a slave, is now a fellow servant, a dear brother, a slave to the gospel. Each of us can learn from these that Paul is sending his greetings to. And you who are slaves to sin can move from that slavery to sin to find freedom from your sin as you pursue slave to righteousness. The Bible says, to as many as received Jesus, to him he gives the right to become children of God. That's the invitation to you if you don't know Jesus today. Maybe you're in a season of doubt right now. You're not certain that if you were to die that you would go to heaven. These things have been written so that you may know that you have eternal life. So the prayer for you is that you might have assurance and that we also might have spiritual maturity, that we might find ourselves to be the crew members instead of the passengers. We are all called to be part of this ministry, and each of us has an important 
part to play in that process. So let me encourage you to find your spiritual gifts. We've talked about spiritual gifts. How do you find your spiritual gifts? Over the years, there were a number of spiritual gift assessments, and you can find those online. I can direct you to one if you really want to. But the best way for you to discover your spiritual gift is to serve. And when you find the things like, well, that was awesome, you you just discovered your spiritual gift. Some of you love hospitality. Many of you with the gift of hospitality helped set up for this funeral this past Friday. Some of you have the gift of intercession and you're willing to pray people for people like no other. Some of you have the gift of service and you're willing to come and build things and you're willing to vacuum floors and do things like that. And you love doing that stuff and you know it's important to the body of Christ. Some of you have the gift of evangelism and you have no fear whatsoever to go next door to your neighbor and tell them about Jesus. Let me tell you, though, that if you don't have the gift of evangelism, you're not let off the hook because we are all commanded to do evangelism. But some of you have the gift and it's like natural to you. Find your spiritual gifts. Use your spiritual gifts and see the ministry move forward here at our Savior's Baptist Church. So let me encourage you to get on board. Let me encourage you to move from being a passenger to being part of the crew. To complete, as he says, to complete the ministry that God is calling you to. Will you pray with me? Lord, in our hearts right now, each one has a different application. And I pray that your spirit would speak to the hearts of these people. That each of us would respond according to your spirit. To use our spiritual gifts, as you tell us. To take that next step in faith towards spiritual maturity. Or even to assurance of salvation. Speak to their hearts, Lord. If there's some today that are still slaves to sin, may they turn from their sins and embrace Christ and become slaves to righteousness. Lord, we thank you for the book of Colossians and we thank you that we have that recorded for us in your word that we might be transformed by it because there is all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for us. So may we profit from it as we become a little bit more like Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.